Welcome to the 1992 International Space Development Conference. My name is Jordan Katz, and I'm president of the National Capital Space Society, the proud sponsors of this year's conference. I'm also a track coordinator for the private enterprise track. And um, first, uh, just a few uh, administrative notes. This track, uh, as you've seen in your program, is uh, going to cover two days of programming. And um, I've set this programming up in mind uh, to stress some of the uh, current activities and successes in commercial space. And uh, as you'll see uh, throughout the day, there's a lot going on in commercial space. Uh, currently, uh, last night, uh, I heard a quote from the Department of Commerce that the revenues from commercial space activities now equal those revenues from the uh, U.S. motion picture industry, which is pretty impressive. And uh, any rate, so I set up this uh, programming here to stress uh, the wide range of commercial activities, and by commercial I mean non-government. Uh, we'll be hearing from some uh, very innovative speakers uh, from companies dealing in communications, uh, state business initiatives, financing uh, space ventures, future opportunities and directions, commercial space and, uh, transportation, supporting infrastructure, remote sensing, materials processing, and we'll also be hearing from a distinguished panel of U.S. government representatives talking about their roles in uh, commercial space. Well, enough of that, and I'd like to uh, get on and introduce our speaker this morning. Uh, it gives me uh, great pleasure to welcome Courtney Stad the Senior Staff Director for Commercial Space Policy at uh, the National Space Council. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome Courtney here to speak to us for a number of reasons. I had the distinct pleasure of working with him for the last two years on the Commercial Space Policy Review at the National Space Council, which recently resulted in the President's Commercial Space Policy Guidelines Directive, which uh, aims to coordinate and uh, and encourage better cooperation between the U.S. government and the commercial space sector in their relative roles. But it also gives me great pleasure to welcome Courtney because he is really one of the true titans in the commercial space arena. He has been involved in commercial space for uh, many years, almost as long as there's been commercial space. Well, actually, that's not, maybe not that long. Hopefully. <laughs> but <laughs> quite a long time. Courtney uh, got his start uh, with the National Space Institute between the years 1977 and 1980, and in that time he was uh, director of the National Space Institute, so he got his start here uh, with uh, what is now the National Space Society. Uh, he went on to uh, start the launch services company Starstruck, which later went on to become the American Rocket Company, and uh, was instrumental in the formulation of the Commercial Space Launch Act um, in the early 80s, which has now uh, given birth to a whole new industry, the commercial space transportation industry. Uh, from there, he went on into the uh, wide world of uh, inter-beltway inter politics at uh, the Department of Commerce and helped found the Office of Space Commerce uh, in the uh, Office of the Secretary of Commerce. Went on to become the second director of the Office of Commercial Space Transportation at the Department of Transportation in 1986 and 1988. Stepped back into the private sector to uh, do some marketing and get involved in more entrepreneurial uh, launch vehicle companies, such as uh, being on the board of the now International Microspace uh, Corporation. And so, without carrying on a whole lot more, uh, then Courtney went on to the National Space Council, where he's been doing an excellent job working on uh, getting the government to behave like a better partner with the commercial space sector. And the guidelines, as you'll see, uh, will highlight that. And so I would like to turn the podium over to Courtney Stapp. Thank you. Appreciate that uh, introduction. Thank God my wife was around when you referred to me as a pipe. Get away with that. <laughs> um, yeah, what I'd like to do uh, this morning is to uh, take you through um, where I think we stand in the commercial space sector from a macro standpoint. And I'll be succeeded by people like Alan Parker, uh, 
Pete Swan who can give you more specifics about what their particular uh, industry initiatives are all about. Summarize for you this uh, policy, U.S. Commercial Space Policy Guidelines, which the President, which the President signed uh, a year ago in February, and uh, then provide some uh, some general observations. Next slide. The operative uh, paragraph in the National Space Policy, which uh, was first articulated in the Reagan administration, reaffirmed by President Bush, is I think that which I quote here from the November 1989 policy. And it says, expanding private sector investment in space by the, and I emphasize, market-driven commercial space sector generates economic benefits for the nation. And it is with that in mind that we've attempted uh, these past years to try to uh, establish our policy initiatives. Worth noting as we proceed that uh, in the upcoming uh, Department of Commerce 92 space business indicators, that uh, revenues have risen to $5 billion in 92 from $4.2 billion in 91. And of course, that increase is uh, mostly due, uh, as it always has been in this uh, field, to uh, uh, the communication satellite industry. I put that number up not to suggest that uh, things are, are rosy um, at all. Uh, that number, uh, in absolute terms, is uh, uh, it certainly uh, shows that we're making some progress but relative to the GMP and quite frankly relative to where a lot of us thought we would be in 92 uh, 10 15 years ago uh, we have a lot a lot further to go but at least it shows I think that we're heading in the right the right direction next slide please worth emphasizing also at the outset that uh, we're not the only ones on this planet that have recognized uh, the potential of our commercial space sector. And it is uh, certainly true that us, Europe, and other nations are quickly uh, realizing the significance of a commercial sector, although it's probably fair to say that we're the only country to date that has uh, formally and explicitly recognized a so-called non-government sector uh, divorced from the, uh, from, from the government. But nonetheless, uh, uh, other governments are quickly recognizing that uh, commercial space can assist in leveraging limited government resources, translating ideas quickly into marketplace applications, and that uh, at the same time, we have to recognize here that more and more uh, sources for financing markets and strategic alliances uh, are not being confined to our borders. And more and more people who come to my office are finding that the AXIS AXIS is no longer purely a NASA DOD AXIS in terms of uh, the focus of uh, uh, the entrepreneurs, but uh, more and more uh, assisting uh, guidance when it comes to financing from Tokyo, Paris, Bonn, and even Moscow is more and more uh, becoming uh, prevalent in discussions vis-a-vis -vis, uh, alliances and potential uh, sources of technologies. Next slide. As far as I'm concerned, commercial space uh, is shorthand for, for a new mindset. And uh, with all due respect, and I mean all due respect to uh, the new administrator at NASA, uh, it is my view that those of us who have been uh, advocating commercial space uh, uh, for these past many years have in fact uh, been talking in terms that uh, thankfully our new administrator is talking. Um, I think what ties us all together, regardless of our various and sundry differences um, and uh, the extent to which uh, people are involved in different competing lines of products and services are at least the following four attributes, if not more. We all agree that we need desperately to reduce product development cycle times. Uh, we all agree that, uh, that uh, we can do things more cost effectively with smaller project teams. Uh, we need desperately to lower acquisition costs. And we have a long, long way to go, certainly in that area in the government and clearly at all times improving our performance and cost uh, attributes. In my view, uh, regardless of how one defines a small SAT, um, and Alan Parker will, and Pete Swan will talk to uh, two corporate initiatives in that area, in my view, what's exciting about the small, small SAT industry is that they embody certainly these four attributes. Uh, and I think that that uh, augurs for really a, a, a fundamental is an overused uh, expression paradigm shift uh, in the way that we approach uh, space development in the years to come. The next slide, please. 
And bear with me, if you will, for a moment. I'd like to read. Uh, you can't see all of that, I don't think, so I will read it to you. Um, and it's uh, um, Freeman Dyson, a hero to a lot of us, I think, um, who in one of his recent books said, and I quote, Judging by the experience of the last 50 years, it seems that major changes come roughly once a decade. In this situation, it makes an enormous difference whether we are able to react to change in three years or 12. An industry which is able to react in three years will find the game stimulating and enjoyable, and the people who do the work will experience the pleasant sensation of being able to cope. I would love to be able to cope. <laughs> An industry that takes 12 years to react will be perpetually too late, and the people running the industry will experience sensations of paralysis and demoralization. Does that ring a bell? It seems that the critical time for reaction is five years. With a bit of luck, you are in good shape. If you take longer than five years, with a bit of bad luck, you are in bad trouble. Freeman Dyson. Next slide, please. With that as preamble, we get to uh, what has been really the central point of our lives as a commercial space community, which is still dealing with uh, a major impediment. There are others, but certainly a major impediment is the fact that the government is still viewed as competitor versus facilitator, versus, if you will, enabler. And uh, we're very much in the midst of trying to grapple with that. That's not something that's an overnight feat by any means. But uh, if, you had, if I had to give you a one-liner to try to characterize where I think the debate turns vis-a-vis -vis, uh, government industry, it's, it's probably on that uh, line right there. Next slide, please. Well, let me take you back to uh, um, when we first started to do our national space policy. Um, I'm a great uh, believer that uh, one way to uh, deal with what Ross Perot refers to as the bubble of uh, this uh, town of ours oftentimes leads to an artificial feeling of being in touch with society that one in fact needs to reach out and um, I uh, go through uh, continual meetings with industry folks as well as through things such as surveys questionnaires attempted to uh, find out exactly what industry uh, felt uh, were some fundamental problems no revelations but they it was a useful uh, data point in terms of beginning to characterize what the issues and problems were as we began to work our commercial space policy in the 89-90 time period. And I'll say that Jordan was uh, very uh, active and quite critical in, in helping me to uh, put the survey instruments and analyze that data. Uh, well, among other things, what we found as we uh, entered this uh, policy uh, challenge uh, were the following. We found that there were conflicting definitions of commercial space. Uh, more often than not, uh, I would find, particularly among the uh, large traditional companies, aerospace companies, that uh, they would come in talking commercial space because that was sort of the, the thing to do, given the Reagan era and now uh, the Bush era. And you would find after some uh, discussion in Q&A that they really were talking a form of privatization under the label of commercial. And I certainly uh, salute privatization, but uh, in, in, in my view, if all we're talking about, and people here have heard me say this before, but if all we're talking about is transferring title of government asset to private sector and private sector resells asset back to government, and uh, in spite of all the rhetoric about commercial space, all we have to show for this activity 10 years from now, or more widgets, perhaps better painted, less price being sold to the government market, uh, it's a waste of time. And I think we wanted to come up with a, with a commercial definition to try to capture the unique features of what, in fact, I think a lot of us in this room have been struggling to achieve these past years. Secondly, uh, no question, the government, uh, that industry uh, incurs significant, what I call, transaction costs, identifying the appropriate decision-making, uh, decision-makers as well as the decision-making process. Um, you go into government with your proposal, you give it to a person who appears to have some level of enthusiasm, and then the proposal disappears into a black box, and six months later you get a call that, if you're lucky, you get a call that, uh, uh, that uh, suggests that your proposal has, is, is uh, lost in space somewhere. And when you're an entrepreneur, uh, where money, uh, the bottom line is uh, the key factor, that's, uh, that's, that's a, that can be a pretty devastating situation. 
Thirdly, uh, government policies, this is an old story, tended to be, tend to be unstable and consistent and often contradictory. And we certainly found that in spades when we began to look at the commercial space field and the various policies that had uh, been concocted uh, over the past decade. We found, again, to go back to this point earlier about um, uh, tracking uh, decision-making, lack of, again, what I call transparency and accountability in de decision-making. Um, I believe if, uh, if, if your portfolio says that, that you're, you're the person who the entrepreneur should be dealing with, um, then you should be accountable for ensuring that that person is, is responded to in a timely fashion. And finally, no clarity regarding, in fact, what is the ultimate goal of commercial space policy. The next slide, please. And finally, uh, uh, other findings from the industry surveys uh, indicated that our transportation research facilities are limited, costly. Um, government insensitivity to time value of money, that is uh, David Osborne's entrepreneurial government thesis notwithstanding, that is built into the culture of government, unfortunately. But certainly we can do a better job of trying to make us a bit more uh, sensitive uh, to, uh, to the entrepreneurial needs. And finally, uh, uh, government acquisition process not designed for commercial products. There's nothing new there. But what I try to do in these two slides is at least uh, remind all of us uh, of uh, what uh, the basic uh, uh, themes uh, that were recurrent in the commercial space uh, world were back three years ago. Next slide, please. All right, armed with those findings, uh, we set to work. And we uh, uh, came out with our commercial space policy uh, guidelines. And here's a quick overview as to what those that five-page document uh, is attempting to do. First, it defines commercial space. Uh, we came up with four attributes. Private capital at risk should be existing or potential uh, non-governmental uh, customers. The market ultimately should determine the success uh, and finally, the primary responsibility and management initiative resides with the private sector. If you're saying that uh, these all entail judgment uh, calls, you're absolutely correct. There is no uh, empirical uh, standard you can use for uh, any one of these in terms of the, how much capital, private capital should be at risk, uh, over what period of time should the market determine the, uh, success, etc., what is success. But they at least were a set of benchmarks that we hope will become uh, help uh, influence and uh, uh, establish uh, the right, if you will, proactive environment uh, when, when government decision makers are confronted with uh, commercial space initiatives. The policy uh, recognized, identified the five sectors, uh, ComSats, launch, service, vehicle services, remote sensing, commercial infrastructure, and materials processing. The overriding objective of our policy, I want to emphasize, is to reverse the current situation where the government dominates anywhere from 80 to 90 percent of space industry output. A long-term goal is to have the government eventually be a modest part of the commercial space markets. And what I use as an example is the global positioning uh, uh, satellite situation, wherein the government spent uh, a lot, a lot of money, you know, hundreds of millions to develop the uh, network of global positioning satellites. And then, uh, uh, last administration, uh, we reconfirmed it, allowed, deregulated it to the extent that we allowed civilian access to the GPS. And out of that came names such as Trimble, Magellan, uh, and other companies that, uh, Qualcomm and others, that are uh, taking advantage of the position location services of that system. What I like about it is that I don't read about, I don't see the ads for these companies in Aviation Week. Instead, I read the ads in uh, cruising or aircraft or maritime magazines. And to me, that is exactly where, where uh, that, that to me is a sign that, uh, at least in some sectors, commercial space is beginning to reach a level of maturity. Because it, in fact, is ultimately the consumer society that we should be appealing to. And uh, when Pete Swan gets up, not to steal his thesis, but I have no doubt that he will mention that Motorola's uh, view is that Motorola takes that as a matter of course. But for any of you who've had any association with the aerospace industry, uh, uh, you know, where the government has been the market, uh, that's a fairly revolutionary concept. Next uh, slide. 
the significance of the guidelines uh, is that for the first time, uh, we have interagency consensus on the ways in which the government can encourage commercial activities. And this hopefully will contribute to stability and consistency. And having lived through many, many bloodbaths um, <clears throat> over the past uh, seven years, uh, one of the things, one of my objectives was to uh, arrive at a document where all the agencies felt they had equities. It doesn't help you. Uh, you know, I, I, I can go around and, and, and claim uh, all sorts of policy victories, and that's, that's terrific at the expense of a given agency. It doesn't help the commercial space sector if uh, an agency that has been, to use the bureaucratic term, rolled uh, and feels vanquished, doesn't help you to go into that agency and, and that agency not feel it has any equities in the policy. Next slide, please. Now, what I want to do in the next few slides is give examples of, uh, of the guidelines, uh, indicate uh, the role that's been defined, and again, give examples of where I think, um, where the government is specifically uh, 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 supporting uh, commercial space uh, initiatives. I just want to emphasize that the importance of the guidelines is, in fact, to provide a, guide, a framework. So that uh, what we attempted to do was to think through the various and sundry ways in which the government interacts with the commercial space sector. We came up with seven or eight ways. I'm about to identify those ways. They will appear to be very common sense. But I think it was the first time in the process that uh, we had attempted to rationalize and clarify the ways in which we uh, deal with uh, the industry. And secondly, uh, what is not up here in the geographs but is in the directive, is to try where possible to call out specific uh, terms and conditions so that you, in putting your business plan together, the government bureaucrat, in terms of responding to business plan, have at least some common understanding of what those terms and conditions are. I also know in the geograph here that in some cases, government involvement with the private sector may cut across uh, several uh, roles and responsibilities. I mentioned up here the uh, NASA Centers for the Commercial Development of Space is a prime example of something that cuts across NASA's customer and uh, cooperative agreement and other relationships that I'll get to in a moment. Certainly, Comet and Commercial Experiment Transporter being uh, supported by uh, NASA's Office of Commercial Programs is another example of, of an issue that cuts across various roles. First one is customer. Government clearly has a fundamental role in terms of using commercially available goods and services to the extent feasible. And examples are launch services, remote sensing data, and of course, uh, uh, commercial communication satellite time, defense and civil use of, uh, of, of commercial satellites. Next slide, please. Unused capacity is another instance in which we can help industry. Making unused government assets, services, and infrastructure available for private use. Examples of sharing of facilities, radio frequencies at government launch ranges are, are, are two that jump to mind. Surplus assets. Making available space-related assets that are surplus to government needs in accordance with law, treaty obligations. At the same time, recognizing the regard must be given to the impact such transfer may have on the commercial space sector. I mentioned the external tanks. I was involved in a uh, uh, commercial uh, initiative called Global Outpost. that seeks to uh, commercialize uh, the uh, external tanks. Um, that's an example of the nuclear motors and components and surplus ballistic missiles. You have another example. Next slide. Technology transfer is another role. Uh, government engages in promoting transfer of technology from government um, auspices to the private sector and encouraging participants in, in the private sector uh, participation in cooperative R&D programs, as well as with state and local governments. And I mentioned here regional technology transfer centers, which is a relatively new initiative being undertaken by NASA and other agencies. Uh, we have the ongoing national technology initiative, which is an outreach uh, by commerce, energy, NASA, transportation. Uh, defense to uh, to industry, which entails a, a number of workshops around the country. Um, <clears throat> this is the uh, area where we get into a bit of re reference anchor tendency with proper bar and but let me hold off for that for a second. Next slide, please. Deregulation is another one, and uh, this is an ongoing theme, which is an effort to try to avoid regulation, which unnecessarily deters commercial space sector activities. Uh, I'm sure I'll go to my grave uh, continuing to fight that one, but that is certainly an ongoing uh, headline and uh, certainly every day that uh, represents another challenge for us. 
and I mentioned you're opening up international telecommunications to uh, competition, commercial arms licenses, and so forth. There's two examples that represent uh, uh, efforts at, at trying to, to uh, deregulate, though there's some in the industry might regard arms licenses as adding to regulation. Next uh, slide, please. Cooperative agreements uh, gets us to the thinker tenant concept I referred to earlier, where we agree to enter into appropriate agreements with the private sector to encourage and advance basic research, development, and operations. And agencies may agree by being a tinker tenant, uh, that is to say the government would agree up front to, uh, uh, to uh, buy a certain percentage of product or service in order to uh, give that uh, private sector uh, entity uh, some anchoring so they can go out and seek uh, ultimately non-government uh, market support. And Space Hat uh, is certainly an example. Purchase of data from the uh, Sea Star Ocean Sensing Satellite involving the orbital sciences and Hughes is yet another example. And the Boeing Crystal by Vapor Transport Experiment is certainly yet another example. There are others, but those are the three finals under mine. And finally, we get to the next slide, please. The next uh, and uh, role is, of course, trade, and that is working toward the establishment of an international trading environment to encourage market-oriented competition, and examples of the U.S. Uh, PRC agreement, the ongoing ESA negotiations, what we call rules of the road, and certainly opening up international telecommunications markets is certainly uh, an example of that. I'd like to focus on this for a second. Um, <clears throat> do not take uh, the trade area for granted for one moment. You must recognize in commercial launch services that uh, there was, at this point in time, the exception of the PRC agreement, no protocols, no structures when it comes to uh, dealing with uh, fair pricing, dumping, things of that sort, the sorts of uh, practices that, uh, uh, and structures you take for granted in other industry sectors are simply absent uh, in the launch area, commercial space goods and services area, with the exception of telecommunications today. So we have uh, established a space trade office over at USTR, and uh, their, their uh, <coughs> whole uh, uh, goal is to uh, work uh, these agreements so that over time as we develop uh, viable uh, goods and services, we'll in fact have a, uh, a, a trade regime that uh, will be responsive to uh, the realities of trade, which is uh, you know, there will be challenges in terms of dumping and. Uh, so forth and so on. It's just part of the commercial practice. Uh, I have the next slide. Let me uh, add that uh, this past week we summarized the guidelines in this uh, brochure, which I, I brought about 100 copies here for distribution for the, to the council to the conference participants in the next couple of days. The significance of this uh, brochure is that we have a pres presidential seal on something called commercial space. Uh, we call it the pathway to opportunity. We have uh, President Bush in here with a quote uh, about commercial space. We have a summary of, of the guidelines and then some pretty pictures that basically summarize um, the various sectors. And you'll see a movement from government to commercial for trade here, um, even asteroid mining. So yeah. Go back and tell some of your friends, people. Asteroid mining in here. Uh, solar energy, tourism, uh, as, as many pictures as we could get. It's always surprising to me is the dearth of uh, good pictures in the... Uh, well, some of the pictures came from the National Space Society. Some of the pictures came from the National Space Society, indeed, and those were some of the better pictures I might have. Um, also, there's an insert um, which uh, uh, includes names of people at uh, the various agencies uh, who are points of contact when it comes to further questions about uh, policies, and these are people who uh, have the responsibility to help advocate, support uh, various commercial space initiatives. I think the, uh, the names are probably less important than the fact that uh, there is a document and it's, that, in fact, identifies people uh, and agencies uh, throughout the government. And that is, I think, uh, something that uh, is part, again, of this effort to try to uh, make the decision-making process uh, more transparent and, and accountable. What I have up here on the screen is uh, a, just a rapid-fire summary of various initiatives ongoing in the government. 
uh, vis-a-vis -vis commercial. I'm not going to spend time going through all of them. It's purposely meant to look busy because there are lots of things going on vis-a-vis -vis commercial with varying degrees of uh, success and various degrees of progress. But uh, suffice it to say that uh, I could not have put that chart up uh, five years ago. Um, and again, uh, I don't believe in cheerleading. I'm not suggesting that uh, it'd be nice to have about uh, 50 of those charts to put up. Uh, and perhaps we will in the next few years. But there's, there's a lot of activity ongoing in the government is the commercial. Next slide, please. Before leaving the guidelines, I want to emphasize that we do regard them as a living document. Uh, they will be subject to revision, collaboration based on experience, but you have to start somewhere. So we put out what I regard as the baseline. And again, as we uh, address problems and issues over time, we will amend it. Uh, we have a commercial space working group, which is a standing group, which I chair with the Space Council. Uh, we meet periodically, uh, driven off times by, uh, by issues and concerns. But from time to time, I will pull a group together uh, simply for information, to find out what the latest uh, developments are in the industry. For example, uh, the recent work World Administrative Radio Conference in Spain to establish frequency allocations uh, for the coming decade uh, is an area that will have significant impact on uh, the uh, satellite communications world. And that would be an example of the sort of briefing that I would uh, call for from the FCC so that all the agencies are brought up to speed on what's going on. I have, not with me, but uh, a document that I use for internal purposes that Jordan also helped, and uh, Royce Donnelly back there, who's an old friend of the NSS, of course, who uh, helped on the most recent iteration of this document, which is a white paper that tracks developments in, in the commercial space sector. It is a paper which uh, has a matrix which matches uh, the rhetoric in the commercial space policy to what uh, agencies claim they are doing to carry out uh, these initiatives. And uh, it's what I call a truth in advertising uh, document. And it helps me and uh, track uh, uh, you know, exactly what, what's going on. And, and when I meet with industry, I pull it out. And they tell me whether it's, uh, uh, whether it's true or not. And it gives us both a, a source of calibration. I also uh, did a very quick uh, survey uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, back to industry, back to the same people who responded to the original survey, and I said to them, basically, look, it's been a year since we had this, these, this document out. How are we doing? How badly are we doing? And uh, this is just a couple of snippets from, uh, from that, but uh, not a whole lot of surprises. But uh, in terms of evaluating government roles, regulation continued to be viewed as a major impediment. 24% uh, saw positive action since the guidelines came out a year ago. 55% over half have seen no action since it came out, and 21% have seen actions, uh, but question to what extent those actions have been uh, desirable. Uh, that's an important data point for me, uh, and uh, shows that we, because again, we, we've got a lot more work to do. Um, if you go to the next bibliogram, please, we'll be finishing up in a couple minutes. We also asked us, the respondents to rate the health of the various sectors. Um, and you will see up here, it's probably hard to read, but uh, about 28% view the entire commercial space sector as healthy. Uh, nobody saw the commercial space world today as very healthy. 10% saw, if anything, declining. 30% view it as uh, basically unstable, i.e. uncertain future. And about 33% uh, uh, view the commercial space sector uh, as basically stagnant, partly through some of the anecdotal uh, information provided to us based on the recession and cost of capital, etc. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of business potential, again, no real revelations, but the satellite communications were seen as having the highest ongoing potential commercial infrastructure as second. Thirdly, space transportation, remote sensing is fourth, and materials processing uh, was up there uh, as, uh, as, as the final uh, one. That over a long period of time to have uh, uh, business potential. Next slide, please. I won't dwell on this, uh, but uh, in fact, on the back of the brochure, we uh, have essentially that budget chart that's up there, U.S. Commercial Space Revenues, um, but it breaks down mostly the telecommunications and remote sensing and launch revenue 
and it basically backs up the, uh, the five billion that we uh, talked about. Um, but uh, when you have a chance to look at it in more detail in a brochure, again, uh, the breakout is not uh, surprising in terms of the maturity of telecommunications launches versus the other sector. <laughs> And now I, let me uh, end on a final reminder, the last chart, which is, uh, you can see that, uh, what, it, what that pie on the left says is that uh, most of the pie is U.S. government, uh, roughly 80%. Commercial has a fairly small wedge. And I think the point of what we're all trying to do in our various ways, government industry, is to flip it. Um, I can't tell you when that will be flipped, but. I'm dedicated to is trying to flip it so that uh, my successor one day can stand up and mention that uh, uh, that uh, companies that are going to be talking to you in the next few minutes, in fact, are providing the bulk of the services, and that uh, most of what we're doing in the government is uh, doing things that industry can't do, which is to carry on long-term R&D. And when we need our products and we need our services, uh, we turn to what we hope and expect will be a robust. Uh, commercial space industry. Uh, we have a long way to go to achieving that goal, but I think it's worth reminding ourselves of what, uh, what this thing is all about, which is uh, really what people like Jerry O'Neill, who uh, recently passed away and had a great impact on a lot of us, uh, was all about. Uh, Phil Salem, who uh, passed away, uh, was the founder of uh, Starstruck, which is now American Rocket Company persuaded me 13, 14 years ago this thing was all about. Uh, Dick Brackeen, who passed away, it's been quite a year, a couple of years ago, a couple of months ago, who was the former chairman of Fairchild and I worked closely with him when he was president of Commercial Titan, Mark Marietta, said it was all about. And uh, George Koopman, who was uh, past president of American Rocket Company, uh, probably not a day would go by before he passed away uh, a couple of years ago, reminding me that that was what it was all about. I think uh, in the footsteps of those uh, pioneers, uh, I think we, we, uh, we continue our, our work. Thank you very much for your time, and uh, I have a couple minutes for Q&A. Okay, yeah, why don't you? Thank you. Thank you. Any, Any questions? questions? Go back to one of my interminable working group meetings in about <laughs> 15 minutes. But. Anybody has any? I've actually satisfied with that, sure. Can you tell us what goes on at the National Space Council on a daily basis? Uh, sure. Um, <clears throat> let me start uh, with, uh, with with commercial. Uh, a good part of, of uh, my day uh, is devoted to. Uh, uh, Working, working groups that are pushing any one of a number of issues. Uh, we currently have a situation with uh, Inmarsat, an organization which uh, has uh, been uh, approached by the, the Russians to uh, launch their next series, uh, Inmarsat 3, Inmarsat 3s, on a uh, proton. Uh, that's an example of an issue that uh, Space Council would uh, be approached on and would, would be involved with. Um, we have an ongoing procurement working group, which is uh, in the final stages of developing a report on where we stand with acquisition practices. Um, <clears throat> my ear was attuned to uh, the Appropriations Committee last year, which uh, mentioned that they had some heartburn when it came to anchor tenant concepts. Uh, the Appropriations Chairman uh, saying that uh, he was concerned that anchor tenant uh, would result in what he called entitlements. Uh, wherein we enter into these commercial service type contracts and the Congress sort of loses oversight control over them because they're, by the very nature of the, of the uh, industry, the, more often not they're multi-year contract obligations. And rather than going through the typical oversight process, he was concerned about uh, the implications of that. And one of the aspects that I've been working on is trying to work up with the work through a multi-year scheme that would uh, comport with commercial practice at the same time recognize uh, the Congressional uh, Office of Management budget, budget uh, uh, procedures, and budget scoring, and all that good stuff. So that's an example of something that, uh, that we are involved with uh, as, as a Space Council and as a working group. 
more often than not, issues again get staffed through working groups that have uh, half a dozen or more agencies with equities. Uh, then a lot of companies come through, uh, private sector organizations come through, domestic and international, on a continual basis, uh, seeking uh, either uh, giving us inputs on where things stand or uh, identifying problems that, in their view, need to uh, need addressing. Um, quick thumbs up. Where we stand. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Well, um, yes, I was asked if I could elaborate more detail on the multi-year uh, contracting scheme. Um, I'll elaborate a little bit more, but I'll, I'll say that uh, I'm uncomfortable getting into too much detail because we're, we're still working it through, and I, I don't want to uh, uh, get ahead of the power curve vis-a-vis -vis, uh, briefing other people in the government. But, uh, it seems to me that we have to strike a balance uh, between the uh, current situation where government is more comfortable entering into progress payment uh, relationship with, uh, with industry uh, and, and has all, we call it commercial, but has all the features of a cost plus. And more often than not, the contract officer in government uh, will sort of treat it like a cost plus and tend to add all sorts of specs and details and. You, the commercial person, started out with what you thought was a fixed price situation, find that, uh, uh, that the program keeps being added to and therefore costs keep going up. I won't mention the examples, but there are a couple of fairly prominent examples in the commercial world that I think are suffering from this. Um, <clears throat> so if I have to find a, I'm trying to look for a compromise between, uh, um, between uh, the government uh, practice on that side and the other side, coming up with uh, an incentive for industry to enter into these agreements. And uh, one of the notions that uh, I've been playing with is uh, trying to, uh, in a fixed price situation, and in a situation where uh, there's clearly uh, a, a market, this would not apply to uh, uh, any one of a number of uh, initial uh, commercial initiatives, but one that uh, at least it is, is a second generation commercial initiative. And I, again, I don't want to, for number of reasons, name examples, but I can think of a couple of examples where over the next couple of fiscal years we'll, we will have acted as an anchor tenant as the government. If successful, that initiative will have established a customer base. And then I think it's time to think in terms of the following, which is to uh, uh, agree to what the multi year uh, contract value is, um, work through that. Uh, again, in a fixed price situation. And then up front, the government to uh, uh, basically uh, set up a reserve fund, uh, collateral, if you will, a fund, um, where we would, uh, uh, in the out years, um, keep the, uh, uh, the, uh, the funds uh, in, in his, really in a reserve fund, in an escrow, is what I'm looking for, not collateral, an escrow. And we would hold that, and in the event that the government uh, terminated at its convenience, that would essentially become a termination liability fund. Because one of the fundamental problems that industry has entering any of these commercial service contracts is that the government can uh, terminate at convenience, and right now there's no necessary obligation to pay direct and consequential damage. And uh, I'm trying to think through a process that recognizes the fiscal straitjacket the government finds itself in. And surrounded by colleagues who don't want to have the government enter in any more contingency obligations, more than we already have. Uh, and it seems to me if I can try to work through an escrow account that essentially becomes the uh, termination liability account, uh, that, that is one approach. Now, it also puts the onus on industry. Instead of getting progress payments from government, uh, the onus on industry to go out to their uh, financing sources and basically use this escrow obligation is the equivalent of a warrant in going to their uh, uh, financing institutions and putting their financing package uh, together. So that's it as a notion, and I want to get further than that because we're still uh, thinking it through. One more, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Trent Lankoff from the East Texas Space Society. My question is on the Russian space program. Yeah. Uh, right now, they appear to be the low cost provider, the only reason they aren't on the market international sanctions against them. Uh, trade agreements 
haven't been made. My understanding is with Americans, you take $80 million in two years. With Ariane, you take 18 months and $60 million. With the Russians, you could pay them $40 million and launch tomorrow afternoon. Uh, what are the issues being addressed in, uh, given that Russia is now a democracy, in letting them into the space launch market? Well, uh, I would qualify what you just said. I, I, I think that uh, that's an optimal situation there on Russia and the U.S., but I think if you ask any one of a number of satellite users, they might question both the cost and, as well as the time involved with any one of those uh, new organizations. But having said that, uh, a couple of things. One, uh, I think with our March 27th announcement, press announcement, where the president indicated that there would be a presumption of approval when it comes to uh, uh, export-import applications vis-a-vis -vis the Russians, that there in fact is movement on this front. And the uh, announcement uh, is quite explicit that we are encouraging uh, U.S. private sector to seek, actively seek opportunities, quote unquote. Now, um, in terms of the trading regime that I talked about, Keep in mind that, uh, the, that the Russians, and we have every interest in encouraging them toward a uh, decentralized, democratic, capitalist, some variant of capitalism, um, they'd be the first to tell you they're still moving in that direction. It is also uh, clear, and again, I think the Russians would be the first to tell you that uh, they need a lot of work in terms of understanding those concepts which all of us here in this room take for granted. Um, Profit. That seems like such a commonsensical concept. I have no idea what it means. Uh, also, if you look at the development of uh, capitalism in this country, it took us a period of time to understand uh, what that means. Uh, they uh, are really going through a business one on one uh, tutorial as we speak. Uh, for them, any uh, additional monies, hard currency above and beyond what they perceive as their investment. Is profit. Uh, if only that were the case uh, uh, for, business, for the business world and in the Western world. But uh, so I think what, what, what uh, speaking from my standpoint, it's in all of our interest to encourage their transition. It's in all of our interest to uh, establish a uh, regime that uh, has basic fundamental principles that we take for granted in these other, in other industry sectors. Uh, fair pricing. Now there is no magic algorithm to define fair pricing, but there is a difference between a price which is absurd and a price which is low and uh, is sobering if you are a U.S. company competing, but from the standpoint of, of, of an honest, objective observer, simply has to be managed. Um, and I would suggest to you that we've seen cases with the PRC that is really in the absurdity. Uh, and I think uh, hopefully with the Russians uh, will be more manageable. Secondly, the whole area of uh, inducements, uh, political pressure, and other supports which governments bring to bear that unfairly distort market uh, is certainly only a fundamental principle we need to get in place. We do not have that currently in the launch services area. It is a principle we're seeking to achieve with ESA. Uh, and it's the type of thing that I think we will need to have in place these are the, uh, uh, the, the former Soviet Union. Uh, I think we need to do that now. Same time recognizing that uh, there are opportunities perhaps in Russia that uh, we want our industry to take advantage of. Uh, but keep in mind that if we don't put these structures in place now, that uh, a few years from now it's going to be a lot more difficult. And uh, I think uh, we may regret lost opportunity. So in a nutshell, we recognize uh, the need to deal with them, and we are trying to take steps. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. I, I, oh, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's uh, a, a very good tone for the next two days of programming in commercial space. Um, unfortunately, Courtney can't be with us. Uh, he's got to get back to the rough and tumble world of, of interagency politics. And, um, but any of you have any other questions about Space Council related issues, come and see myself or Roy Stalby and uh, we can help you out.